This show is sponsored by IdealWorkspace.com, which promotes a healthier way of working through their adjustable standing desk. Check out their latest smart adjustable standing desk at Altizen.com. A-L-T-I-Z-E-N.com. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business, technology, and media in Asia. In this episode, I speak to Alan Soon from the Splice Newsroom and Rockstar Accelerator. We discuss how the media industry has evolved across Asia and whether the new media businesses such as the Information Box and BuzzFeed can work in Asia. Hi, Alan. Hey. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing then? I'm good. It's a nice sunny day in Singapore. Yes. Guess who I'm talking to? I'm talking to Alan Soon, founder and CEO of the Splice Newsroom and ex-Yahoo, managing editor for India plus Southeast Asia. And I think you're also the, the country manager for Singapore as well, right? That's right. I've been one of your fans because you are involved in the media business and you know the region very well. I want to get started because I want to get to know you better. How do you get started in the media business? Oh, let's see. So this goes way back. I've been doing this for about, see, I think I started in 1995. Actually, this was part of my national service at the time. So this was the year that I had just come back from doing my university degree, came back with a degree in communication, went to the army like all of us. And they basically said, look, we're going to set up a radio station here. Why don't you try to help us put it together and write the news for us <laughs> since you've got a degree in communication. So this was quite a funny way of getting into it. This was like three months after basic training. And they said, hey, come join us, write the hourly news bulletins for us and you know, go around and, and cover all these uh, army events, which was great. I absolutely loved it. It was a great start to the career. It gave me a chance to go look around at all these different army bases, follow the defense minister around and cover stuff that age most people would never get, get a chance to do. You have an illustrious career from mainstream to digital media because I know you spend across China News Asia under Mediacorp, Bloomberg, CNBC and Yahoo. You want to talk a little bit about some of the interesting career lessons that you have gone through? Yeah, it's funny. I was just thinking about this the other day, right? Just thinking about the number of pivots I've done in, in my career so far and just being in the right place, right time and just being lucky about that. I think what was interesting, you know, so after radio, I moved over to TV. That was the start of something, you know, different for me. Radio, as you know, as all these podcast listeners of yours would understand, is an audio experience experience where you tell a story and people pulled into it. TV was very different because not only do you have audio, now you had to visualize what that story looked like. And so it taught me new skills around how do you write for sound? How do you write for visuals? And that was an expansion in itself. And then later on, I also worked in Newswires, magazines, but mostly in TV, just because it was such a phenomenal media at that time. <laughs> I say at that time as though it's a long time ago, right? It's not. And the industry has changed a lot since then. Just the way we look at video and the way we think about television and television broadcast. I've got a lot to say about that. So stop me. <laughs> mm. In that kind of transition, how do you get yourself to pivot from one platform to the other. I mean, from printed media to radio media, then to now digital media, where the distribution is almost endless with so many platforms. Yeah, I guess, you know, from an early stage, I was already starting to see how these things could come together. Like the question I always ask my clients is, what is the atom of your production? What is the one thing that you guys do every single day that means the most to you? What is the product basically to a tech community? And if you understand what that atom is and you distill it to in very clear terms what it is, you start to see how can I take this little piece and run it across different places. So for example, if you work in a TV broadcaster, your main atom would be a clip of video. So understanding what that is, how do you create that atom as simply as possible? How do you streamline that operational process? How do you take that creation of something new and just push it out in multiple channels? These days, we think about pushing out to OTT, to Facebook, to YouTube, you know, and so on and so forth, right? So some of these things have changed quite a lot, but the whole concept of what is this piece of content that you create, I think that's the essence of it. You have left Yahoo and eventually decide to set up the Splice Newsroom. What is the motivation behind the company and what does it do? Well, I was at Yahoo for six years. And in that time, we worked with a lot of partners on the ground, a lot of newsrooms, you know, a lot of publishers themselves. And every time I would visit them and talk to them, you know, the one thing that came out starkly for me was the realization that they didn't really understand where things were going in terms of digital. They didn't see the opportunities that digital was providing them and they didn't understand how to make the best of it. Six years at Yahoo will do that to you. It will give you a very different mindset in the way you look at content, the way it's created, the way you run a business around it, the way you publish it and all that. And I thought I really want to help transform this industry. The ecosystem in, in Asia, as far as media goes, tends to be quite stifling just because 
we haven't had the full impact of what we've seen in terms of business economics of U.S. media companies. A lot of the media companies out here are owned by families or they're owned by big conglomerates. And they simply accept that the newspapers or TV networks that they own are just cost center. These were never set up to go make great amounts of money, let alone figure out how to ride this wave of transformation that we've got with digital. For this company, where you help to build out newsrooms and consult for newsrooms across the Asia Pacific, right? Can you talk a little bit about what do you usually do with all these different media groups? Yeah, so the one thing that they all have, and you know, this is the one common problem that they have, is what should be the first step that we take in this digital transformation? It's a very basic question, but it's also a very hard one because every newsroom at different levels, and I work with like super old (laughs) legacy ones with new startups as well. And they all have the same kind of issues, but largely it's around how do I take the first step? So what I do is I try to get a better understanding of their problem. And I look at it from four basic aspects, right? So it is people and culture, which are soft skills. Do you have the right people in place? Do you have the right culture in place that helps you transform yourself? Do you have the right attitude when it comes to change? And then the second bit would be tools and workflows. So once you figure it out, the soft skills, do you then have the right hard skills to go out and make this stuff happen? I would spend usually a course of a few days or sometimes even a couple of weeks with a client to understand how they work. And basically, you know, what I'm looking for would be, how does the culture work in your newsroom? Do people execute on things just because that's the way they're told to do? Are they looking for a new way of working? Are they frustrated with their current systems? Based on that, I get a good idea of how the workflow should be, could be. I would start working on tools to recommend that would help make their lives easier. That's interesting because that comes to the topic of today, which is we want to talk about media in Asia Pacific. Given your experience, how has the media business changed in Asia Pacific in the past decade, transitioning from mainstream or printed media to digital media? I mean, The early days is all search engine. I think now even social media is considered passe. What's your experience been? Yeah, so when I joined Yahoo, we were still very much at the portal phase. And I call this like the the 1.0 phase. 1.0 1.0 phase is when you build a website and you just add services to it. So Yahoo started with email and then it added Messenger, it added media content, and then it added you know search as well, right? Not, not necessarily in that order, but this was a 1.0 view of the world where it was if we could create one thing, stuff it with great services and you will come. Soon after that, we came to 2.0, which was this whole thing around SEO and search. When you want to know something, you look for it. And that will take you to different places. So that was 2.0. 3.0 is where we are mostly right now, which is the social phase, where your understanding of the world, the knowledge that you're trying to derive from the world, largely comes from your social experience on Facebook or on Twitter or Instagram. Right. And that's that's generally where we are. Obviously, I think the fourth phase would be in terms of, of new platforms like chatbots, like machine learning types of, of devices. I think we're starting to see the emergence of phase four now. You know, it's just been an ama- amazing journey if you look at it. It's just all been happening within the last 10 years or so. How does the media industry segmented itself in Asia? Quite poorly, actually. <laughs> the, the fact is, there are still a lot of media companies that are very entrenched in the way they work, largely because, as I mentioned earlier, these are family-run businesses or largely part of a, of a conglomerate. And so understanding and having that flexibility to make that change has been very difficult. The fact is also that overall, we haven't had the impact of the kind of changes we've seen in the US in terms of ad revenue coming down, in terms of lower reach for newspapers and and traditional media. Out here in this region, a number of newspapers are still doing a very strong business around what they do. The need for change and the and the catalyst for change hasn't really hit yet, I would say. The only one thing that's starting to really crumble right now is in terms of talent. So these days in every single newsroom, attracting talent is one thing, retaining them is another. Right now in newsrooms, the key challenge is how do you keep this stuff going at a time when competitors such as Facebook Twitter and all the other tech startups are starting to pull talent away from you. If you are a journalist going into the industry today, you have more options than you've ever had. It may, it may not be you being a reporter anymore. It may not be you being an editor or a producer. It may mean that you go over to Facebook as a product manager to understand how to push out media content. Mm. Right, And that's where the industry is changing. And this is probably the biggest threat to the traditional newsroom institution out here. But you also see very pockets of innovation that's happening in China and also in India. I'll use in the, I'll go to India first. For example, there is something called the TVF channel, which is basically someone creating a content who is now actually being VC funded. And he, they are actually uh, driving by doing satiring of uh, people or famous celebrities with their satire versions as well. 
and then they impact it with like for example in China where you have something called Zhibo, which is you basically live broadcast and they create things like e-commerce buying of things etc I've seen mm-hmm. a lot of this kind of very interesting innovations particularly in parts of Asia with very huge populations that's right yeah so yeah the whole Zhibo phenomena is quite uh, you know massive right this is actually the same kind of playbook if you think about it as what we've seen with YouTube you know celebrities YouTube stars the same kind of working model I think that's fine as far as you're trying to push a product for example but you know if you're trying to build a brand around that I can I think it gets really hard satire works but also at the same time it's like you're not the first choice when it comes to news that's happening or if you wanted to find out more about something right and and this is the the challenge that I think the industry needs to, to get ahead around. Do you want reach or do you want a brand? You can't have both in most cases, right? Yeah. Just to add on to the example for China, there was the lady by the name of Peppy Jiang recently. She got funded by Venture Capital. I mean, if you look at the same equivalent case in the US, PewDiePie, he hasn't got funded by any Venture Capital. So I don't know, the kind of media industry, the way how it's evolving in Asia, it also looks very different with what is happening in the US. Isn't that the case? Yeah, I think, you know, in, in Asia, a large part of this is is still, I mean, as, as you know very well, a lot of the VC money is chasing after what's going on in e-commerce and, and logistics. So it's natural that this money starts to see these things as being connected, right? Media plus e-commerce tends to be a theme that I'm starting to see as well over here. I was having a really great chat with one of the top executives at the Nation newspaper in, in Thailand recently, and uh, they were telling me about what they were doing in terms of logistics. He said to me, look, we've got a distribution network of vans that go out every single morning to drop off newspapers at booths, at newsstands, at shops, schools, whatever, right? And those vans are coming back empty. And so the question we asked ourselves was, what can we fill it with on the way back? What they've done is they started collecting shipments, bringing back to their depot, and from there redistributing it. So there are a lot of some of these ideas that, that are starting to emerge where they're starting to understand that. So as, as a newspaper company, we have tremendous reach. We have an ability to get out to places every single day to deliver things on time. So what can we do in terms of logistics, right? So that's become an interesting thing that's, that's emerged. There's another great example of this being done in, in Guangzhou with Guangzhou Daily. Exactly the same stuff, but not just logistics, but also e-commerce fulfillment. So some of these things are starting to emerge. And, you know, it's, it's no surprise that you're starting to see VC money chasing after celebrities um, online. The next question I probably want to ask you is what are the kind of business models in media that work in the Asia media scene? And also, in general, how do content makers actually interface with the business owners? I mean, I think there are two kinds of content makers. There's the content makers, there's like the you and I who have our own little pl- a boat and then just create the content and just throw it into the internet. And then there is also the pro- the professional TV stations, the newsrooms, how does it work? <laughs> Our little boats, you know, obviously can be compared to the bigger publishers. But I think the, the one big difference that you see on both sides is that the key difference here is your ability to push out stuff on volume consistently. And this is what big newsrooms are very capable of, right? The Washington Post, for example, pushes out piece of content, whether it's photo articles or videos, every two minutes, on its website. That's an amazing amount of content. And that's what traditional newsrooms are optimized to do. They are optimized to deliver pieces of content consistently at scale over and over and over again. And that's what they do, obviously, at at a huge amount of cost to themselves. And that's a kind of of thing that we've seen thrive in, in Asia. Unfortunately, you know, the problem with the with the media market is that we're very much still married to this whole concept of reach and therefore advertising. Those two things are starting to unbundle themselves in other markets, especially like in the US, right? Where you're starting to see interesting ideas coming up around niche content. Instead of going after as mass of an audience as possible, what is the smallest, most engaged audience that we can go after that's willing to pay for it? And I think these types of ideas are starting to to emerge in, in Asia. I think the time is right for it. And do you see how about like transactional models, like what we were just talking about, the concept of Zhibo with e-commerce transactions? Do you think that that would eventually also scale because the distribution models, but it's a little bit like pay TV advertising, but now in the internet world? Yeah, so I, I was talking to a friend of mine who created a, a tech blog in the Philippines, and I was telling him 
that at some point you got to bring in stuff like reviews, like high quality reviews where you then work with the e-commerce suppliers to drive sales, right? So one really good example of this is uh, the wire cutter in the US. And what these guys do is they basically write fantastic reviews, very critical ones as well, but they also uh, with Amazon and, and the rest of them in terms of affiliate marketing to help drive traffic. And obviously, if someone buys the product after reading the review, they get a cut of it. And I really believe that that's the way to go. I mean, this stuff kind of works in, in very niche categories. Tech is obviously closer that comes to mind. The other would be probably, you know, in terms of maybe clothing, lifestyle services. You know, I think that's that's the way to go for it. And I think that there is the other one that is actually very well known in WeChat called Mo Gu Jie, which actually mm. they do fashion as well in China. Yeah, and they actually what they do is they're tying up as an e-commerce site directly with the apparel that they review online as well. Exactly, and so the, the challenge there is how do you first build a brand that's credible, right? So that you can give critical reviews to the products that are out there, and then you know hopefully drive the traffic for conversion. Because not every single product you're going to agree is worth buying. And to have that credibility comes back to what journalism has, has always tried to strive toward, which is to build a, a credible brand. So that base is interesting, right? You're trying to tell people, go out and buy this gadget because I'm telling you why it's good and why it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wanted to go back to the conversation and advertising. I think you made a very good point about the unbundling. And do you see with things like ad blockers, and also the advertisers, what they do is that they look for a prominent site and then they put their cookies to target the downstream site and actually drive down the prices of advertising. Is it sustainable actually for any media site now in Asia to actually live on advertising revenue? Well, I still think that the industry hasn't changed very much, especially in Southeast Asia in that sense, right? So for instance, in Southeast Asia, the ad revenues have been traditionally quite low. It's been growing, but it's still low versus traditional media. In that sense of it, you're not going to see a massive disruption just yet in that space as far as pricing and that goes. But I think, you know, what's what's interesting is that there was a report that was released last week and it basically talked about ad blocking on mobile devices. Asia leads the world when it comes to ad blocking on mobile, far greater in numbers than the US does. And what's really interesting about this is that there seems to be an awareness among Asian consumers that, first of all, you don't want to see ads, but more importantly, ads are costing you money because it's costing data. So that is, strangely enough, becoming one of the bigger triggers in, in pushing for form in the advertising business. Banners just are not viable you know, much longer, right? People have found a way to get rid of them because they don't like them. And if they don't like them, why are you still trying to put it up in front of people? So I think a lot of these things will change fairly quickly. It's really exciting times, I think, for the advertising industry. So where do you see the core drivers of growth now in the media space in Asia? Well, core drivers, I mean, you know, there, there's still this ongoing shift to mobile that's happening for publishers. So you see a lot of mobile like news organizations trying to figure out how the best layout is on mobile. And that's going to help them drive the, the traffic that they're looking for. But that kind of a bump will only happen within like the first year of, of revamping a, you know, a mobile site. But overall, the fact is, you know, anyone who's getting a new phone today or getting on the on the internet for the first time today is likely to just go to Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so it's also the distribution challenge as well, I guess. That's right. So, you know, this is one thing I tell my clients, like, you know, the, the days of, of mass reach are over, right? We've got to figure out a way to think very clearly about what is the content we're putting out for, but more importantly, which audience are you going after? And then spend that, that marketing dollar targeting them accordingly. Because you know what, on, on Facebook, you're going up against everyone else. You know, if you are a newspaper publisher, your rival is not the other newspaper in town, but it's everyone and everything that is on Facebook. Mm. Everything from an e-commerce ad to something your friend posted, a video that's come up from somewhere, you know, all of these things are competing for your time. And users just don't have that time or have that patience to sit through one feed after another. It's just not sustainable. We've reached a point of peak content. You know, the days of producing more content in, in the hopes of reaching more eyeballs, I think we've, we've maxed it out. I think all of us are, you know, when we open our Facebook apps, we, we have a maximum number of scrolls that we do. And I think for a lot of people, it will be like three or four scrolls and that's it. If you were a marketer, if you were a publisher, you have to think really hard about how you're trying to get those eyeballs. How does localization of the media, for example, languages and culture factor into the media business? I mean, Asia is very diverse. You have China, you have India, you have Southeast Asia. 
I think localization is one of the ways in which you can personalize content even further. And I think that's an important thing that often gets gets forgotten, especially, you know, if we live in Singapore, like you and I do, we often, you know, see more English language content than anything else, right? And likewise, if you were in the Philippines or in India, you tend to see more English content because that's just the way it is in terms of uh, volume of traffic and volume of content. But if you were a new publisher studying up today, my advice to you is look at, at localization as one of the ways in which you personalize. Do you have the right language context? Do you have the right cultural context, the you know, right local context? You know, I think these things become more important as we find more niche audiences uh, going forward. And then, of course, one of the major challenges for media in Asia is the regulation of media by governments, unlike in the US where you have the First Amendment. I know of your experience in Yahoo with the Singapore government when it came to news site. What's your advice to how digital media outlets can navigate around the government when it comes to controversial content? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a really tough one because every single government kind of has the same issue. They want to keep a light hand on what's going on, but on the other hand, also understand that there's a need to, to regulate in some of these cases. But, you know, if the fact is that your consumers are spending most of the time on Facebook, how are you going to engage Facebook on these types of, of matters, right? And, and every single week you see one of these types of stories coming up where there's a new takedown request in some country or like, you know, in the case of last week, Iran is pushing foreign chat apps to base their servers or rather their data to store their data in Iran itself. These types of things come up all the time, right? All governments are trying to understand this. We're seeing a massive disruption, not just in the media space, but, you know, you look at transportation and what Uber is doing in, in a lot of these policy meetings, you know, the same issues are coming up. Like, how do we think about technology? How do we use it? And I think governments are still trying to understand that. I mean, you know, the heavy hand approach is to censor completely, to block it completely. I was just in, in Beijing earlier this week. I know what that looks like when, uh, when you have content that's blocked, right? And it is very drastic. It's a sledgehammer approach. I'm sure there are better ways of doing it. And I think a lot of it has to do with governments talking to these platforms and really understanding how they work and, and what the limitations are going to be. You can't stop these changes from happening. This is just the way technology is evolving. You just got to figure out a simple way of understanding if this happens, then take this approach. I think the sledgehammer approach of even banning media content or banning platforms have also giving the governments that actually does that the same problems. The companies that they are actually trying to go global is not, are now paying strategy tax of not getting enough information. I mean, because right. our economy is becoming more and more globalized. There is this view is that like, for example, for some governments, if they ban YouTube, the economics work against them then. Exactly. So, you know, my big learning about this was, you know, was, was my time in China this week because I run my entire business on Google apps and none of them worked. <laughs> so no Gmail, no Google Maps, no photos, no YouTube, obviously. Like all of these things that I built around an ecosystem just didn't work. And that was phenomenal. And you think about how many small enterprises, startups that are building themselves around, you know, Google apps, that kind of restriction makes a huge impact on the way they operate. It's very hard for someone from outside of China to go in and try to operate and run a small business with this mindset that we have. We go in there, we expect everything to work just because it should. <laughs> Obviously over there, there, there are a multitude of options if you were building from scratch there. But yes, I mean, this was pretty clear to me when I was there, like thought that a whole ecosystem could fail to exist just because the government didn't like this one URL. Very few startup media outlets have actually been successful in reaching scale in audience distribution, particularly in Asia. I think there's this misconception that actually you can get a lot of scale with such a big population. Why is that so? Well, scale is just a hard thing to do. The fact is, you know, the whole concept of scale, as far as publishers go, comes back from our time in broadcast media, it comes back from our time in uh, newspapers, when we thought that if we just put something out there, millions of people will read it. And of course, we know now that that's not true because we can track every single person or every single unique view, at least. And we know that's not possible anymore. And the fact is, one page view doesn't mean that someone actually read it properly. It doesn't mean that they spent time engaging with it. it. doesn't mean that they did anything with it. And so a lot of these things are being questioned right now. And I think we've come to the point, and I've been calling this for a while now, you know, we need to end page views as a metric. And it's taken this long for us to have this, this conversation. The whole issue of scale is a very difficult one. And it's something that gets even more expensive as time goes on because people are spending less time directly on the publisher's websites 
people are spending more time on Facebook, which means as a marketer, if you were to market your content on Facebook, you're going to end up spending more money. And that's just the ecosystem that we live in right now. It's not sustainable at all. Is discovery or curation more important in reaching scale then? So, you know, the thing about curation is that if you think about human cura- curation, you're making the assumption that there's a significant majority of people who want to see the same thing. And that's how that premise goes. If you think about algorithm curation, which is what Facebook is, you take a very different approach. You start to assume that everyone's different and therefore everyone should see something different. So your Facebook feed and my Facebook feed are completely different just because we're different people. And this is something that mass media never understood and because of the nature of the business could never understand that every single person is different. They want to see different things. So there's a limit to your ability to therefore to curate for them. You may be able to create a brand around what you do so that when someone needs information about something, you become the first top of mind destination for them. But for the most part, the age of mass media and the assumption of you know everyone being equal, that's over. If any new media outlet were to come in or even existing media outlet, the focus would be more towards discovery or curation then? Yeah, something a little bit more niche, more targeted. right? So the one thing that every new publisher coming into the space needs to understand is who is it that you're trying to reach out to? And if you take the, the tech perspective and how startups think, the question you ask is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Which I think is an important one. And I think a lot of publishers, new publishers especially, enter this space not understanding what problem it is they're trying to solve. A lot of them would try to give a default answer of journalism, which is to say, to give you the most trustworthy, most credible piece of content or coverage around this big event. And that's just rubbish. <laughs> it just doesn't work anymore. Which form of media are successful in Asia? Rich text, audio, or video? I mean, video, if you and I go to the subway anytime, we will see everybody holding their phones with videos vertical or even horizontal. That's right. I think, you know, there's, these new distribution channels keep coming up and that's good for the industry. I think the more interesting question around that would be how much time does a typical person actually have to spend on media? And if you were to look at tracking that, you notice there's really not much time left to squeeze in even more pieces of content. And of course, the implication there is that if you are a video publisher in this space, how many pieces of content do you have to create? How much more do you think you can try to squeeze out of this in terms of video views? It's really hard. You know, when, when we're on the subway, the stuff that people watch are shows from Netflix, they're shows that they've taken off BitTorrent. They're just multiple channels in which people pull in their, their content these days. That makes it even more challenging. I've recently read an interesting report from, I think it's the Ericsson Report on Mobility the amount of mobile data traffic it has actually grown by another 15x like every year that's amazing and it's getting into i mean we are talking about a pattern after terabytes we're talking about exabytes just looking at across china india and southeast asia that's stunning right and i think obviously a lot of this stuff is driven by video which is fascinating to me and they're just like wondering that like, how much pipes do we still need to build in order to get that kind of data access coming back to the point are the cost of production for media actually going down given the rise of platforms such as youtube and periscope yeah, I think to a large extent that has definitely happened. So you look at the entire slew of workflow tools, everything is cheaper than it's ever been. The move to SaaS has been a tremendous help to newsrooms who cannot afford to pay for boxes of software doing a one lump sum payment. So, you know, moving to a monthly subscription model for some of these tools totally makes sense for newsrooms because it really helps with the cash flow. And, you know, you look at all the tools that are available out there for people to build stuff on, to create content, to distribute it. That's just phenomenal. You know, there's something new that happens every month or so in that space. Something that comes out that promises to do something faster, cheaper, and with better scale. So a lot of these changes are happening. You see the change in, in mindset as well these days. Some of the faster moving newsrooms are more willing to go out and let their orders use their iPhones to shoot videos, to edit videos on the iPhone itself, and then to distribute straight from that iPhone into Facebook. This is really encouraging to see. It really helps lower costs. It keeps things more nimble. And the entire process is digital native. Given said that, do you think that, like, for example, even for the normal newsroom where you need to do the gathering of data, because those are actually cost intensive, right? It's very difficult to do investigative journalism in Asia. Do you think that that cost would never go down? It depends what kind of category you're talking about, right? I think, you know, what's the gold mine of investigative journalism is really the amount of data that's out there that as a journalist you can mine. Now, 
The fact is, not many governments have digitized their full base of content or make them available in terms of APIs. But as that shift continues to happen, and you know, obviously we see this in Singapore, the Singapore government is very good at making this data available through APIs that people can, can then build on, which for an investigative journalist, that's really helpful because you can easily mine trends at the speed of an algorithm. So that's where I'm most excited about. I think, you know, once more governments start making data available for you to build on, things will, will start to shift there. I think that's going to be an exciting time. I want to get into another interesting part of the conversation, which is talking about the emerging trends from the US to Asia. I think people, you and I looked at the US and look at some very interesting media brands like Vox, BuzzFeed, and subscription-based targeting niche groups, for example, The Information and Stratagory by Ben Thompson, they're all becoming popular. Can these concepts be actually mapped to the Asia market itself? I think to a large extent they can. And, uh, you know, what, what I like about the information, for example, and I'm actually a subscriber to the service. Same here uh, as well. <laughs> it's the most expensive content subscription I have. But the fact is, they're providing a niche service that no one else is. You know what was really interesting the other day was when the, the CEO of Nest quit Google, the information actually put together a conference call for subscribers to explain what was going on when why it was important. And that's amazing. So if you think about how this new publisher is working, they're working on, they're not just a news provider in a traditional sense. They're also performing the role of what a research analyst would have done at a research house, financial services sector. You also see the information setting up junkets to take their subscribers overseas, most recently to China, to meet with top CEOs, including those at Tencent and Alibaba. The role of traditional news publisher has changed in that sense. And I really think that the information, kudos to these guys, have really been pushing the edges on this one just to see where it can go. Just last week, I had a potential client coming up to me and saying, hey, we've got all this great content. What do you think we can do with it? (laughs) <laughs> which is always an interesting question. And then you go back, try to push the conversation to a question about USP. What is your USP? What is it the one thing that, that you can provide and no one else can? Going back to the information, these guys spent a lot of time asking themselves, what is the USP? What is the problem you're trying to solve? The problem that you want to solve as a publisher in news today is, how do I give you the information? How do I give you information that no one else has? How do I give you insights really quickly without me having to write you an article. And I think the information, again, kudos to these guys. They're really trying to make a change in that space. I, I thought I should also mention a, a site that I actually also subscribe to called Tech Opinions. They're actually formed by former IDC and a couple of very respected tech analysts. And what they do is that they actually put in the trend sub notes. I think Bloomberg is now doing an equivalent called the Bloomberg Get Fly. Yes, that's yes, right. They are doing it for free and versus like Tech Opinions is actually creating subscription-based models. So there's this challenge that's also on onslaught that's coming from the big guys like Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal at some point because yeah. the information is modeled very heavily against Wall Street Journal. But I want to talk about the other two brands. Like for example, Vox. I think Vox is made out of very strong media brands with very strong personalities, but also on the very different business models. For example, Recode, The Verge. How yep. do you see the media brands like Vox? Well, again, you know, these guys are, are serving a very niche community, right? So they know exactly who the audience is because they know what is the problem that they need to solve and they go out and do it. And I think they do it in an incredible manner, right? So Vox is fascinating for me on two fronts. Firstly, as a builder of content brands and also as a platform. So if you look at the way they've described their CMS, for example, in the early days, they talked about its flexibility, how easy it is to provide that layer of, of newsroom operations and making that easy for each of these brands to use. And I think that's one way in which a news company needs to think about. How do you lower costs, right? One of, one of the ways to do that is to make sure you're sharing the same technology backend. And the CMS is a huge chunk of that. It's interesting where they're going. But again, you know, they know the audiences very well. Vox started with the sports site, I forget the name of it. And that's how they started to think clearly about who the audiences were, how to increase that engagement. In fact, I think the record recently, what Mossberg talked that it's better for a media site to actually develop itself as a brand rather than to try to go for mass traffic, which comes to my next point then. What about yeah. BuzzFeed, which is clickbait media, right? You have Upworthy, you have BuzzFeed and a couple of others along the way. How does that yeah. work? Then? Well, you know, I think that worked for a couple of years. I think it worked for maybe two or three years in which everyone was moving on to Facebook. And again, you know, as we, as we talked earlier on this call, the shift away from social is starting to happen. And we're seeing some of these things manifest itself. BuzzFeed is, first and foremost, the most important publisher of the social era, I would say, right? These guys figured out how to 
to create content that went viral. They taught us the word viral. And now we're seeing everyone else doing the same thing. The issue that BuzzFeed faced from day one was that they were creating something that was very low tech. There was no tech USP to it. So a lot of publishers would say, and you know, I've had some clients come up to me and they were like, how do we do what BuzzFeed does? What is it that they have in a technology stack that, that enables them to find trends quickly and, and make stuff go viral? The fact is they don't. There is no one single tool that they use that helps them do all that. In fact, there was a really great podcast with the editor-in-chief at BuzzFeed in which she was saying that at the end of the day, it really comes down to the rigor of the process that they have. They have an operational rigor that requires them to look at certain things, go to certain sites, dig in, dig in, dig in, and basically doing the same stuff that journalists should be doing anyway in looking for trends, looking for things that are emerging. BuzzFeed does a great job at it. They have a strong voice in that space. The thing is, they're heavily disrupted. If you look at every single headline at the bottom of your article page given by Outbrain these days, they all start to sound the same. They all start to sound like BuzzFeed. This is a problem for BuzzFeed itself. On the one hand, it's created an incredible engine for reach, but on the other hand, they've sacrificed their own brand and their own voice and process because now everyone else is doing the same thing. There is this interesting question I wanted to follow up is that are there challenges in mapping the business models of these US media into Asia? For example, Asian consumers prefer not to pay for content. I've been testing this with a couple of friends about, you know, doing subscription-based models for media sites. Yeah, so, you know, if we were to talk about something in the tech space, for example, it really comes down to what is it you're giving me? Are you giving me articles? Are you keeping me updated with what's going on? But the most important thing is, can you give me stuff that no one else can? So maybe as a member, you give me free access to your two conferences that you hold a year. How's that for crazy? <laughs> if there's a big story that's happening, let's get on a conference call so you can explain to all your subscribers what's happening in that space. Make me feel like the smartest guy in the room because I have information that no one else does because of this service that you provide. If you go out and market yourself as a paywall model, you pay this amount, you get to read all these articles. That doesn't fly anymore because a lot of these articles are available everywhere else. But if you can inform me and teach me about things that I never knew about or understood, maybe you can run a workshop every three months about a certain subject and I get, I get to go in for free. You know, it becomes a very different type of community that you're trying to build. It's no longer about you feeding the content. It's about you building a community around it. You trying to build that, that information and knowledge around it that no one else can. With the rise of wall gardens such as Facebook, I mean, we talk about it quite extensively in this episode. And the medium and the rise of ad blockers that read the ring almost advertising insignificant as a revenue stream. How does media outlets in Asia actually has to navigate these constraints to be successful? Well, you know, the one thing that I find surprising is that despite all the data that they have of their subscribers, and I'm talking like print, for example, right? Print has a great database of all their subscribers, but what have they really done with it? Why don't they know me as a news consumer? So instead of sending me marketing stuff, you know, in the mail, send me something that you know I would find useful because now you should be able to track how often I go to your site every day, what stories I read every day from your site. Based on that, you should be able to map out a really good understanding of me as a person and therefore starting to personalize some of these things. So, for example, I would love to have a media company that understood that I'm available for networking maybe two nights a week. I like to meet people or build a community around people in tech and in media and tell me where these things are happening. Better still, organize it for me so that I can go. All these types of things, we need to, to really understand. And one really good kind of analogy to this is take a look at what's happening in the hospitality business. I think in the last couple of years as well, they've seen a huge disruption around this space because their brands were getting diluted by people just buying cheap stays through travel sites and travel aggregators. They're looking for ways to simplify the brand so that people have it top of mind and also to create a more personalized experience for everybody given the amount of data that's out there. If you look at how, how the hospitality business is trying to map you as a person to understand you and what you like, I think there are really great examples around there. They should already know like how often you travel, which are your favorite cities, how often you normally stay, what you like to do on your stay. And based on that, have a better understanding of what types of services to sell you in the future. That's interesting. So it's, it's probably that we need to map the profile of customers. It's, it's interesting even from a person, myself doing a podcast, I actually know who my audience currently are. Exactly. And, 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 and it's interesting, I actually engage them much more than usual on that. And the thing that they always tell me is that there's something that in your podcast, you can tell them that I don't know about Asia. 
So exactly. So, so that's the kind of thing that I think is actually trying to get that kind of time into that person's time for your media outlet. Yeah. So you know, when when you're a big publisher like I was, you know, we went after millions of page views. You know, everything needed to be like big, massive numbers. But it doesn't matter if you have a hundred million people or ten million people or a hundred people, if you don't know who these people are. The only way of measuring them was through page views, and that is like the most ridiculous way, the most blunt instrument that you can use to understand your audience. So I run a a small newsletter, which I absolutely love putting out because. Every single week, I get someone writing back to say, "Hey, I liked what you said about this, or I like this story that you put out." I actually know who these people are. You know, the moment someone signs up, I do a very quick kind of background check to find out who these people are, what do they do, what do you, what do I think they're interested in, and then over time, I'm starting to see a pattern in which certain stories are, you know, that that I feature are, are doing better than others, and I really get a feel for what my audience wants. I know I know people by their names. I know a lot of these people also by by faces as well. You know, I know exactly the audience that, that I'm publishing to. And this is exactly where I think the the industry needs to go. Given the amount of data that's out there that's unfortunately all held by largely held by Facebook, we should have a much better understanding of our audience. We don't have to go for mass audience anymore. Yeah. Right. And I think the industry is ripe for disruption again, you know, in this space of who is your audience? Understanding your audience and then targeting them in a better way. So before we conclude, I know you are going to be starting a new gig soon. What can you tell us about what you will be doing in conjunction with the Splice newsroom? Well, I've added a new <laughs> a new title to what I do. I'm going to be managing director of Rockstart in Singapore. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for some really exciting startups to get behind this region. As you know, I spend a lot of time in, in the emerging markets running Yahoo. So the emerging markets are fascinating to me just because there are problems and then there are solutions that most people have not heard of just because these are, are unique cases, right? But what's what's amazing about the way Rockstar is thinking about this is that if we could build a program in Singapore, we could build a, a program in, in Colombia, which we're, we're doing for Latin America. What are some of these interesting ideas that we can see emerging from these, these markets that we can take, learn from, help them accelerate it, and then apply it? the same knowledge and learnings to other markets. And I think this is the kind of stuff that investors should be looking forward to. And I think, you know, startups themselves should be excited about just because there's just so much that's going on out there in these markets that are unique. So we're looking for unique problems, unique solutions, and then try to find a way to scale them uniquely. That comes to my final question. How do my audience find you then? Oh, easy. So a couple of ways. If you want to reach me, reach Twitter, uh, Alan Soon, A-L-A-N-S-O-O-N. Very simple. I, I'm quite a Twitter fanatic, so please just reach me there. I promise to respond. How about your <laughs> newsletter as well? So, okay, so for the newsletter, go to thespliceNewsroom.com and you can sign up for it over there. You can find me at BernardLeong.com or at BLeongCW. Subscribe to us at Analyze Asia, A-N-A-L-Y-S-E Asia. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud and Acast and recently now on Google Play as well. And of course, really tweet to us, drop me a feedback, and we're always happy to hear from you. Once again, Alan, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this.